Hey, good morning and happy Mother's Day. Uh, my name's Dean. It's great to gather as a church this morning. Uh, we're going through the book of Acts. We'll be in Acts chapter 13 today. Uh, and before uh, we uh, jump in, I'm going to remind you for the third time, because third time's a charm. Uh, we, Sarah told you, the video just told you, on Memorial Day Sunday, May 28th, and 4th of July Sunday, July 2nd, we're going to be at 9 and 11 only. Since 67.3% of you will be at the beach anyways, uh, we're going to adjust the schedule uh, just a little bit. Uh, so don't forget, put it on your phone, make a note, May 28th, July 2nd, 9 and 11. Normal summer schedule, the, ter- the times you go to now, all the rest of the week. So let's pray together, and then we'll jump in. Our Father, we are thankful to be here today. We're thankful for the gift of the local church, your design that we get to participate in this morning. I ask that you be with all the moms here today. We thank you for them. We are grateful uh, for mothers. Your grand design that you would choose mothers to bring children into this world. Uh, for mothers in this room who, all are, who have raised kids, who are now grandmothers, who are just getting started, who are expectant mothers, adoptive mothers, foster mothers, or for all people playing the role of mother, or we are grateful in the name of Jesus for them. Uh, We also acknowledge that today, as we gather as a church, we rejoice at those who rejoice, we mourn with those who mourn. Uh, We're real life here, as you call us to be in the scriptures. We're a community. Uh, So we know that this day is also hard for some. If somebody misses their mother today, or other factors that may make today more difficult than a normal day would be, uh, for others, maybe their desire to have children, Lord, we just ask for your peace this morning. We ask that uh, that you just allow everyone in this room uh, to know that you are near that you are a God who keeps his promises to us in Christ, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. But we also celebrate as a church. We look beyond ourselves and celebrate the gift of motherhood today, and we are grateful for it. Lord, so I ask for everyone in this room uh, that we will be people who, when we are reminded of the role of a parent, that we will look beyond that to what everything points us to, and it's the love of our heavenly Father, the one who loves us perfectly and is always with us. So I ask that you keep the enemy out of this place today, that you allow this to be a great day for many, that you be with those who are struggling, and maybe with all the churches in Tallahassee as they gather today, maybe those who haven't been in church in a long time are willing to go back today because it's Mother's Day, let that be an occasion for them all over this community to hear the love of God found in Jesus Christ. It's for them, and we're thankful for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I think one of the best things you can do on Mother's Day, the best thing that the church can do for you is talk about Jesus. So Acts chapter 13, uh, here we go, verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, Saul you might know as Paul, that would be his Roman name, Paul, who had a miraculous conversion to Christ for the work to which I have called them. God has called them to a specific work. Then after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. There's something important about the church blessing the work of the ministry. Uh, We have anyone in our church who goes off on the mission field internationally full time. We bring them up here before the church. We pray for those people. We believe God's called those people. So I think it's important that as a church family that we come together and bless that. We don't think we have special powers or anything like that. It's simply a commissioning uh, to go forward. Uh, We'll do that with our high school graduates. You know, we'll commission them, pray for them as they go forward in the ministry that God has called them to. So what's happening here is Luke is continuing, Luke's the author of Acts, he's continuing to highlight the Holy Spirit's power in this mission. That these people have been given a clear direction by Jesus to go and be witnesses, then he reminded them that he would never leave them, he would never forsake them, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and because of that, they are now dependent on the Spirit of God. They are a dependent people for God to use them, empower them, guide them, direct them. So what we see here is what is called the first missionary journey beginning. It's the first time they now are deliberately going on the mission field. Before they had been scattered because of persecution, they would end up in different communities and they were here, we're gonna talk about Jesus. Like we're in this town, we're gonna talk about Christ. Uh, So here they are actually having plans. They're spirit-empowered, they're spirit-led, but they're also saying we need to be deliberate and intentional about where we need to go to tell people about Jesus. This whole world needs to hear. Jesus told us the world needs to hear about God's love understood in Jesus Christ. So here we go. And they set off on this missionary endeavor. And it would be difficult, just like it's difficult for us here today to try to live for Jesus. It was difficult for them. Verse four, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, 
They went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God. That was their job in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. Luke is a very detailed writer. No details left out. When they had traveled the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. He was curious about this message. They were proclaiming that Jesus Christ had risen from the grave and he wanted to know more about it. But Elimas, the sorcerer, that is the meaning of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. That was his goal. This person would not believe in Jesus Christ, that he would not become a Christian, would not become a believer. How often today do we still see people who seems like their mission is to turn people away from the faith? It's not new. Here it is happening in the first century as the gospel message is going out. But Saul, also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, so it's of God, he's not in the flesh here, stared straight at Elymas and said, you are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You son of the devil, an enemy of all that is right. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. You son of the devil, an enemy. He says, won't you ever stop perverting? That's what he's doing. That's why Paul's outraged. The straight paths of the Lord. Our, road, our lives are never on a straight path, it seems like. We take different journeys, different directions, but the way of the Lord is straight, and it comes through Jesus Christ. It is through him forgiveness of sins is accomplished, and he is the message. And here this person is perverting the way of the Lord, and Paul is rightfully outraged. He says this, he pronounces judgment on him. Now look, the Lord's hand is against you. Why? Because he's perverting the message and keeping people from understanding God's love. You're going to be blind and will not see the sun for a time. Immediately a mist and darkness fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then when he saw what happened, the proconsul believed. He received the good news of forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So what's happening here in this text that seems really intense and pretty heavy and may seem to some of you as pretty harsh? At first reading, it's like, man, what a thing to say to somebody. I mean, imagine staying up at work tomorrow and being like, you son of the devil and enemy of God, right? I mean, like, it'd be quite the event. Usually we just post that stuff on Facebook, right? Okay, so those, not in person. So those who point people away from biblical beliefs are not taken lightly in the scriptures. They are never taken lightly. He is making the straight way of the Lord, verse 10 says, crooked. So what does that look like today? We might not see sorcerers walking around, unless maybe you're in Jackson Square in New Orleans one night. Uh, you're not gonna see sorcerers walking around but how do we have encountered this type of event today in our world? This is not a one-off, kind of historical, one-time nugget in the scriptures. There's showing us to a more common event that happens regularly that we're told in the scriptures and have a precedent that we must stand against. And I have several things. There's probably 20, but I wrote down four. And the first one is anything, what is a false teaching that we need to be careful of? Anything that suggests that it is by your efforts that one is made right with God. Any belief that suggests that it's through your goodness, your good deeds, your righteousness, your behavior, your morality, your values, that you can be forgiven of your sins. All of those things are great ways to live your life, being a good person, sincere, morals, values. All those are wonderful virtues by which to live. None of those things deal with the greatest human problem which is the fact that we have sinned against the holy God and our God will not let sin go unpunished. So the good deeds we do are very nice things and I think they're even important things, but none of those things cancel out the reality that we stand before God as guilty people of sin. It also points us any kind of teaching that you gotta do these things, be right with God, it makes the mission that they are on unnecessary. Because why do we need to tell you about Jesus if you don't really need him because it's fine on your efforts? We can, we can go a step further. The cross of Christ is unnecessary. 
Jesus coming to earth, Christmas is unnecessary if there are other ways to be right with God outside of the mercy of God being forgiven in Jesus Christ. The Bible owns that. and says in Galatians, if righteousness can be attained by keeping the law, by doing the right things, following the rules, and Jesus died for nothing. We must reject any message that suggests that we can be reconciled to God in any way apart from the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Because Jesus never failed. He never fell short. He never compromised. So we look to him and not ourselves to the forgiveness of sins. Anything that suggests it's by your efforts, even religious efforts, if it's through confirmation or first communion or even getting baptized, as important as that is, or reading your Bible, like, like none of those things make you right with God. Jesus Christ is who makes you right with God. You see, he forgives you of your sins and puts you in right standing with him for all eternity. The next thing is anything that celebrates what God prohibits. Anything that celebrates what God prohibits. It's trendy to say things like, well, the Bible's not, you know, it's not a list of rules, it's not a list of regulations, and that is true. I believe that to be true. The Bible is, the, is really a love story. It's a missionary love story of God redeeming a people to himself, of God reconciling his people to him. But part of what it means to be the people of God and to serve and follow a holy God as he has laid out for us now how we should live. Like what it looks like to actually live the Christian life. Also to what it looks like to bring him glory. I don't have the right to say, no God, not what you say, what I say. Not what you say, what TikTok says. Not what you say, what my professor says. Not what you say, even what my mom and dad say. What God says in the scriptures is for his glory and also for our good. We cannot ever accept any teaching that celebrates what God prohibits. It violates the glory of God, and without us even realizing it actually is for, it's not for our flourishing, it is not for our good. I call Mother's Day National Return to Sanity Day, because for 24 hours, we get to actually acknowledge it is women who have babies. And that is by God's design. It is by God's design. I'm, I, I was created to be a man by God. I'm a biological male. Praise the Lord I can't have babies. <laughs> Praise Jesus. We have gotten to a place where we, just, we don't even know why we believe certain things we believe. But you're just forced to accept it because. And the same people who tell you to trust the science, which I'm very pro-science, are the same people who also tell you that a man can have a baby. It's insanity. And if we care about the things of God, we can never celebrate the things that he has clearly told us are not of him. Which leads us to the next thing. Anything that makes you feel the need to compromise truth on the altar of love. To compromise truth on the altar of love. Christians are called to love people, period. No footnotes, no disclaimers, no caveats, no yeah buts. We are called to love people, why? Because God loved us. So if we, loves us, so if we don't love people, we're saying we're missing the gospel message. Like we're forgetting about the fact that God is love and what he's done for us in Jesus. Another point number one, anything that, that says you have to earn your way to heaven, we must reject. That's the story of God's love. We couldn't earn our way there. We deserve punishment for our sins, but God in his love has not punished us as our sins deserved. He punished Jesus instead. But if God is love, let's take that seriously. It means he gets to define for us what love means. So we have let people who don't believe in God, the one who is love, the one who created love, the one who always perfectly loves, we have let other people set the agenda of how to define that word. So Jesus was asked a question, a great question in the, in the Gospels. He said, hey Jesus, what's the most important commandment? If I had 10 minutes with Jesus in the physical flesh, if he was here, uh, and I, you said you can ask him a question, I'm not sure that's the first question I'd ask him, I'd probably ask him, like, can you save Tom Brady from his sins, please, or something like that. But, uh, but that's a pretty, pretty interesting question. Hey, what's the most important thing? I'll, I'll, I'll please tell us. And Jesus actually answered the question. He was direct. He said, here it is. And he ranked them. It's like, since you asked, the first most important thing is to love God. That's like gold medal number one. He didn't say there anything else is equal. He said, this is first place winner. No, precip no precipitation trophies. This is number one. Love God. And then the next thing he said, there's another one though. He goes, there's a second one that's really important. It's in second place. And it's love your neighbor. That both these things really matter. 
And what he's doing is he's actually summarizing the Ten Commandments. Because all the Ten Commandments are about loving God, but really the first half uh, point us to just simply what it looks like to honor God and worship him only to love God. And the second half shows kind of how you live out loving God in the role of your neighbor. Things like not stealing, not committing adultery, uh, honoring your father and mother, like th- things such as that. What it looks like to, to, add, to love God with feet on it, like kind of in the flesh. So here's what's happening. We believe, oftentimes in our culture, and Christians buy into this, that the way that you love your neighbor is by compromising the scriptures and not saying the truth. But Jesus also told us, here's how we know we love God, which is the greatest commandment, love God. We love God by keeping his commandments. So we're never keeping the second commandment to love your neighbor if it causes us to violate the first. We're not loving God. And I would also argue we're not loving our neighbor if we're lying to someone. So let us be people out of love for God and love for neighbor who refuse refuse to compromise truth on the world's lowercase definition of love. The fourth thing is that as a believer, anything that makes you feel condemned, anything. As a Christian, you have been forgiven of your sins. The verdict has already been rendered. There's no double jeopardy. There is not a mistrial. The jury does not have to come back and deliberate. The decision has been made. You are not guilty of your sins because Jesus, who never sinned, stood as guilty in your place. The scriptures say that our sins are forgiven as far as the east is from the west. They were made new creations. The old is gone, the new has come. That there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That nothing can separate us from the love of God. That if God is for us, who can be against us? So any kind of teaching that holds your past over your head over and over and over again is not of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are there earthly consequences to some of our actions? Certainly. In a fallen world, that's certainly the case. But your standing with God is not based on your performance. It's based on the performance of Jesus. Do not forget that. And it all goes back to the first thing. It's adding things in order to be saved. It's, honoring, it's adding things in order to be right with God. There's only one equation that makes us right with God, and it's Jesus plus nothing. He is the one, and you stand before him as someone who is not condemned. You are forgiven. So the mission goes forward. After dealing with the false teacher, leading, who's leading people away from the truth, which means they're leading people away from the love of God. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Persia and Pamphylia, but John left them and went back to Jerusalem. They continued their journey from Perga and reached Poseidon Antioch. On the Sabbath day, they went to the synagogue and sat down, and they're getting ready to teach the good news. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the Jewish text in a synagogue to Jewish people who needed to believe in Jesus, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, If you have any word of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Paul stood up and motioned with his hands and said, fellow Israelites and you who fear God, listen. They'd have been like, hey, we're good Jews, that's us. Like, we're fellow Israelites, we fear God, okay, give it to us. And then he gives them the story of the Bible. He says, the God of this people Israel, as in your people, chose our ancestors. So he starts with Abraham made the people prosper during their stay in the land of Egypt and rescued them, freed them, and led them out of it with a mighty arm. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. He showed them much grace. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. He kept his promise to his people. This all took about 450 years, which shows us that what we think is forever, God does not think is very long. After this, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. He's just walking through the story. And they're probably going, oh yeah, we know that. We could get an A on that exam. We know this history. We've learned this our whole lives. And they asked for a king. God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, the man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After removing him, he raised up David. They're like, we love David as their king and testified about him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after my own heart who will carry out my will. From this man's descendants... As he promised, and he is about to give them the business of truth right here. I just gave you an Old Testament lesson. You're nodding your heads. You're saying amen. 
David, he pointed somewhere different. He pointed somewhere greater. And you know that because as a Jewish person, you've been awaiting the Messiah who was promised. And I'm about to tell you, Paul is saying up there, that he has come and his name is Jesus Christ. He is God has brought to Israel the Savior, Jesus. He has brought him to you as promised before his coming to public attention. John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Now as John was completing his mission, he said, who do you think I am? I'm not the one. Don't worship me. He's deflecting worship. But one is coming after me. And I'm not worthy to unite, to untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you, including Gentiles, who fear God, who are theists, it is to us that the word of the salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him, or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, as if you're not receiving where they were pointing, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for the death sentence, Jesus had no crime committed, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had carried out all that had been written about him, as in all the prophecies fulfilled, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. In other words, he died and was buried. But, but, put on those pastel dresses, fire up the ham at Nana's. But, Easter Sunday, God raised him from the dead. As in, he's exactly the one that he claimed to be. And if we believe that Jesus rose from the grave, then we can also trust that one day we will too. And he appeared. This is not a hoax, not folklore, not legend. He appeared for many days. For those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were now his witnesses to the people, and they're willing to die martyrs' death, not based on what they heard, but what they saw. He was alive. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news. That's the gospel, the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. It's been fulfilled. God has fulfilled this for us. Their children, by raising up Jesus, I'm even going to quote one of your psalms, he's saying. It is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I become your father. As of his raising him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay, he will not stay dead. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep. The great David, who you revere, he fell asleep as in he died. He was buried with the fathers and decayed, like his body's still there, his soul's with God, but his body will be there until Christ returns. But the one God raised up did not decay. He says, therefore, as in we're responding to this, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes, everyone is justified. You're declared not guilty. You are made righteous. Through him, through everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. The law was not a bad thing, but the law reminded us over and over again of our inability to keep it well or to keep it at all. Every single person in this room, every single person in history except for Jesus has violated the law at some point, the law of God. Just so beware of what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Just give them a warning out of love and urgency. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away. Because I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. Paul's message is very similar to that of Peter's in Acts chapter 2. And what is the point? Jesus is the mission, and Jesus is the message. His name is the mission. The greatest thing we can be for Tallahassee is a church that never stops talking about Jesus. Because he is the point of the entire story that Paul gave him the biggest snapshot Cliff Notes version of ever. You see, God offers forgiveness to the guilty if they repent and believe. If they repent and believe. You might say, well, I came here today because it's Mother's Day. And I was hoping for a Mother's Day message. I have one for you. Jesus is your justification. He is your justification. Not other people's opinions, 
not others' expectations. Not as a mom now of grown adult children, of you thinking about the things you messed up on and could have done better. Jesus is your justification. He is the one that has the word over you. He is the one who provides forgiveness of sins. He is the one that can allow you to take a deep breath. You're right, you haven't measured up. And guess what? That's why Jesus came to earth, to measure up for you. He is your justification. If you're in this room and you're not sure what you think about faith, not sure what you think about Jesus, what is your justification? What is it? Just be a good person? Well, that definition changes every three years. And could it be true if there is a God that you need to be made right with him? But the ultimate question you have to answer is what happened to this Jesus? This one these people were willing to give their lives as martyrs for, not because they were brainwashed to fly a plane into a building, but because they saw him dead. They saw him die. They felt defeated. They were embarrassed. I can't believe we followed this one. We thought he was it. We got duped. Some tried to get out of town to avoid the mockery and the embarrassment that the one they followed about was the Messiah was dead. But he came back to life three days later as he predicted and promised. They didn't get it. And they saw him. And because they saw him, the only conclusion was, Jesus, here's my life. You tell me what to do. You tell me where to go. And also, I want others to know about it. Because you are the one that you claim to be. And the Romans can come after us. The angry leaders of the synagogue can come after us. It doesn't matter because Jesus is our justification. They can call you this phobic and that phobic. It doesn't matter. Jesus is our justification. We're not a perfect church. We never will be. You know what? Jesus is our justification. So it's him we preach. In this world right now, there's just so much pressure all the time. That pressure's not from God. It's not from God. Because he's already done the work. You are a forgiven person. That's why Jesus says that he's like, he's the gate, and in him you find pasture. He, lay, he brings you beside still waters. He restores and calms your soul. And what's the greatest way he calms our soul? It's by reminding us that it is finished and that he is our justification. He is the deep things of God. He is the depths of the Bible. You want something deeper? More of Jesus. You want something with more depth? Go into the depths of what your justification means and how amazing that truly is. So what happens is they're leaving the people, urge them to speak about these matters. On the following Sabbath, they wanted to hear, but just as usual, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed, but thank thankfully, they were hearing about the grace of God. And you can read part of this on your own, but we see that crowds became jealous. They became jealous. But he said, we're still going to preach eternal life. And there is judgment pronounced on those who reject Christ. So we see that they dusted off their feet, the disciples, as a result of the rejection, as a symbolism of that. But you notice that one group was filled with jealousy. They were jealous. The other group was filled with joy. Why? Because forgiven people rejoice in God. Forgiven people rejoice in God. Forgiven people are able to forgive other people. That doesn't mean there's not times in this broken world of sorrow and pain. Jesus wept. He's with us. When we cry, he doesn't tell us to get over it. Instead, he promises us himself. And he points us to our justification. That we are in Christ. That we are part of his family. What he's trying to tell the Jews in that little sermonette he gave them is that everything God promised you for generations, has come true. Jesus did not see decay, which means one day you won't either. Why are we living for a temporary world when there's a world to come that is forever? So let's be faithful here. Let's be urgent here. and Let's do what's right here. 
Why? Because we're not working for God's favor, we're working because we already have it. We want to live our lives as worshipers who bring him glory and honor and make his name known. Like following Jesus is worth it, in other words, because he's exactly the one that he claimed to be. So let's chuck a cultural Christianity where it demands nothing, asks asks nothing, means nothing, and say let's be people who actually follow Jesus, starting with myself included, and live our lives with open hands saying what's mine is yours. Not my will, your will be done. Not my agenda, your agenda. Not the world's agenda that I feel pressure to bow down to, appease, satisfy. But what Jesus says. Because he's the one left standing. And one day he will return and make all things new. And it'll all be worth it. So him we proclaim. The message of Acts, Jim Hamilton says, is that Jesus has been raised from the dead His kingdom is inaugurated, and it's here now. It's soon to be consummated. It's already, but it's not yet. That the work of kingdom building is continuing through the disciples. That God demonstrates his mercy by making a way for sins to be forgiven through the death of Jesus. Upholding his justice through the death of Jesus, God can extend mercy to guilty people who deserve only justice because of our sin against God. This mercy is offered to those who crucified the Messiah, and the redemptive mercy of God is put on display to the teachings of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of the disciples in the book of Acts. In other words, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, so whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is your justification. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he is our justification. I'm thankful there's not a person in this room who knows Jesus, who is defined by their past, or what they're dealing with right now. You don't see someone as defined by their addiction or their anxiety, their failures, their pain, their mistakes as a parent. You see us in Christ as those defined as children of God. The book of John tells us as those who believe in your name, you gave the right to be called your children. You've adopted us into your family in Christ. So Lord, I ask that we will see the gospel as the deep things of you. That we will see the good news as the thing we need the most over and over again. And we will believe it so much we want to share it with others. So what I ask you, use our church to keep sending people, to keep reaching people, to see more baptisms, more college students, more families, more people of every generation who can come here together and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're thankful that he is our justification. Lord, I ask right now in their hearts and in their minds, you remind every mother in this room that Jesus is their justification. Every man in this room, Jesus is their justification. Every woman in this room, Jesus is their justification. Lord, for myself, for the band behind me, for every person in this facility today, let Jesus be our justification. We're thankful that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We are thankful to be the people who are forgiven, who have been washed white as snow, who have been made new all because of Jesus. We worship the resurrected king in whose name we pray, amen.